talking about altars the last while. This morning, I want to talk about restoring our altars. We talked about protecting our altars and because we got something on them, uh, offerings, and then we need to shoo away the births. The enemy wants to remove that. And then um, we talked last week about how when we uh, offer anything to the Lord, it depends on the kind of sacrifice we are making, offering ourselves, our talents, our ministry, the whatever it is we're laying down before the Lord. Uh, God multiplies what, he give, what you give him, like we talked this, mo- this morning about the children. All of those things, uh, when we hand to the Lord, he blesses it and he multiplies it. If we dedicate your vehicles and things like that, we pray for people. If, if, if your car that we dedicate is being taken, taking you elsewhere, you got issues, right? I don't know where that came from, but that's free. But what I'm saying is that when you dedicate anything, it's very dangerous, by the way. I'd rather don't do it. When you do it, watch over that thing. Because God wants to take it and bless it. Bless it. It's a serious matter. Very serious matter. Okay, are we winning? All right. So let's deal this morning with restoring the altars of true worship. And then, obviously, uh, how do we bring that? How do we call that forth unto, unto us, into us, on us, and our families, and so on? And obviously, this is assuming that your, your altars, your, your, your ministry to the Lord, your altars are already broken, broken. And that you don't have a, a serious connection with the Lord, um, and that needs to be restored. You know, sometimes people, uh, they come and they enjoy the church uh, and they enjoy Christianity, the religion, but they miss Jesus. They miss Jesus, miss the Lord. How bad and sad is that? You come all the way and you've missed him because he is the Lord of the church. And so when we talk about worship, it's not just about enjoying, you know, worship. Um, it's about enjoying him, isn't it? So and sometimes our altars are broken, that, that ministry to the Lord is broken, and so we can't really engage because we're far away from him. So, and, and you might think, well, you're not religious, but that is what I just described is religion, where you're far away from the Lord, you have not received him and walked with him and, and therefore your altars of worship have been destroyed or broken and it needs to be restored. And the first thing I believe that needs to be restored is our worship of him. Listen to this text in John 4 verse 23 and it says, Jesus speaking, and he says, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father, our Father God, is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And it says true worshipers there, are they like uh, false worshipers? Yeah, so you need to just think about that a bit. What's happening is the father is looking for his people to love him. Now, if you, if you just look at these verses and go back to 23, you will notice that the father is seeking such to worship him. He's not seeking for worship as much as he's seeking worshipers. Worship he's got. He's got even the rocks are crying out to him. Worshippers are there in their numbers in heaven. But he's looking for people who will be true worshippers. That's what he wants. And if, he, if he's got true worshippers, he's got worship. Do you understand? Because true worshippers will worship the Lord. Other worshippers will just attend, will mark themselves present. 
and think, you know, I got my church today. That's a far cry from what I think God is doing, isn't it? So I'm going somewhere with this, so you've got to be with me. Uh, when our offering in, in, in Romans 12, it says Romans 12, 1, uh, present your, your bodies as a living sacrifice. That's what we, we talked about last week. I, I, it says, I beg you, brothers, by whatever you've heard up until these 11, all these, all these 11 chapters, by the mercy of God that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. God's not going to take your body from you or take anything from you. You're going to have to present it, whether it be yourself, whether it be your substance, whatever it is, uh, it, it is in your possession. And if you love the Lord and you want to serve the Lord, then you would give it to him. You would lay it down. That's why scripture says, well, bring, you were talking about offerings, your tithe, bring it to the Lord. You, you can keep it because it's yours. You got it. But that which is the Lord's is holy and he wants you to present it. And so in this case, Paul here is talking, go back to 12. He's, he's, he's saying that you're offering your bodies, where's your mind and soul and spirit, all encased in the body. He said your spirit is in, included in your body, your mind is. And so present your entire body to the Lord and to say to the Lord, here I am. Here I am, Lord. And then, and it says, present your body holy. Holy does not necessarily mean uh, you're very good. You're better than most. What it means is that you're set apart for God. That your body is not being used for anything else. When you use your body to sin, it's, it's a tainted offering to the Lord. Tainted. Do you understand? Hello? Yeah. Now, if you want to worship the Lord with your body, because that last word there says, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And the word service comes from the word latria. Latria is worship. Where you, your service, your, what you do to the Lord is worship. So, Whatever I do, I must bring glory to God. If I'm messing up with my body, then obviously that's not a reasonable service. That's not a reasonable offering. That is not a holy offering. It's not even an acceptable offering. Do you understand this? I'm not saying anything apart from the word of God, by the way. I mean, I'd like to know how to, you know, bring down the blessings of God in my life. I want to know that. I want to know how the enemy can be removed from my life. And it can't be removed if I'm still offering myself to whatever else. So the story that we're going to deal with today involves the people of God, Israel, and they're what they call syncretism. Syncretism is, a, is tainted worship. It's mixed faith. They're not really pure faith, you know, serving the Lord. The first two commandments, love the Lord with all your heart and, and him only will you serve. Don't make any other graven images and so on, so on. But, but the people of God, Israel, became tainted by a mixed offering and a mixed uh, and faith tainted. And the, and the word we use for that is syncretism, where you, you, you kind of sync whatever you got with other faiths and other ideas. Now that is tainted, and that can't be a sacrifice that is wholly acceptable to God, doesn't please him. Now, it might irritate you this, because this is the word of the Lord. It might it might. Even, you know, make me think, I'm, I'm offended by this. But, but that's because it's the word of the Lord. And in the word of the Lord, as you hear it, it's not about what, what does Samuel know, that's me. What does Samuel know about me? I don't know anything about you. What I do know is what I'm presenting all the time. And something that God is trying to do with us the last while, 
uh, talking about our, our altars, our ministry to the Lord. If you missed it, you need to go back and listen. I would, I would rather we lay down our lives and our bodies. I'm telling you, that is the way to go. If you want to call the blessings of God. See, I can't bring the blessings of God into your life. Then you're going to use me as a priest. Hmm? And that thing don't work. I'm telling you it won't work. Hello? No matter what you think about me, I'm not that powerful or, or very holy. But there's a God who is. And then you need to worship him. Hello? I can't do the kasrat, you know, as they say, and make zum zakr zum, it'll come for you. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's all contemporary. See, no, now you, we are communicating because this is contemporary language. Eh? You and I need to come to Jesus. See, if you don't have him, I tell you, nothing works. So this week, I'm again giving you some homework. Go before God. No, go. So the spirit of God now, that is in the church, what he's doing in this time is bringing unity, uniting us, uniting us in the faith. All the other mixtures and taints and, and uh, syncretism that we're involved in, he is bringing all of us and creating a clean slate for all of us. In Ephesians 4, it says it like this. We must endeavor, or endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit. Whatever God is doing by the spirit, keep it, maintain it. You can't, you can't bring unity, you can't make unity, but you can keep it. The unity is already being made for us in Christ. In other words, you need to submit to that unity, that which God is doing. You are in the world, you're not of the world. If you're still of the world, that offering is tainted if you bring it. We're going around this a little bit, right? So God is busy working. And then verse 4 says there is one body. Not two bodies. You can be in this church. You go to another church. It's all the same. One body. Hello? Whatever you, you're upset with, you'll take it and go there. And they'll become even more tainted. No, no. It's all the same. It's God's. One spirit. One spirit. They're all drinking of the same spirit, Holy Spirit, that we, we've been given. Just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and then one God and the Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And then verse 13 says, What the Lord is doing as he gives us gifted people to minister to us and the idea and the, and the reason for it is to bring, us, to bring us all to the unity of the faith. Not be tainted, not mixed, not everything else, but the unity of the faith and then it gives us a measure of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man. You can't be measured uh, by one another. You can be measured and to the measure of the stature and the fullness of Christ. So that means your ruler for life, your measurement for life is not your brother. It's not even me. Though all of us should be living for God, right? Your measure and how you need to live is the stature and fullness of Christ. See, your measurement, how you measure yourself if you measure with your brother and say, I'm better than him, this, that, that, then you're comp competing and it doesn't work. Your measurement should be of Christ. Go there and see how you measure up with Christ. But I am saying to you, even I am trying to get to that place. This is till we all come. That means we're on our way. And if you're far away, God is waiting for you. And I'm saying to you, when you come to him, do not pressure. In the Old Testament, you couldn't give the Lord um, uh, animals with sores, you know, sick animals. You couldn't bring, you know, half dead animals to the Lord. You've got to bring a very young one, uh, alive, you know, that kind of thing. They must examine, they have to examine the offering. 
examine the, the animals to see if there's any sores on the animals. You can't bring something like that to the Lord because he takes the best. Now, if you transfer all of that ideas to the New Testament, then it's the same thing. And the, because somebody is examining the offering that you're bringing. Not me, the Lord. Because he's the one that needs to be pleased. He's the one that needs to accept it from your hand. Hello? And if you don't bring an offering, then there is no blessing. Hello? How hmm. How much I'll tell them? Who do you think? What do you think? I got, I got somebody else here. An imaginary friend now. Is. And the goal, and the goal is Christ-likeness. That's the goal we got, right? So we are certainly living in these times of secretism. The church tainted. Mixed faiths, mixed ideas. We're talking about the church. Uh, Elijah lived in the context, in the same kind of context. He has the people of God, and they were involved in Baal worship and, and Asherah. And Asherah was a goddess. It was a fertility goddess. If you want children, give your offerings to Asherah. Quite a hectic thing. This is the church, the people. You haven't heard hectic yet until I go through the, some of this stuff. And the people of God, I'm sure the Lord himself is really broken by that. If, if, you, if you gave me a, a gift for my birthday, let's say, there's something that you wore like a 19 foot sack somewhere, and you brought it and gave it to me, wrapped it up in a nice, nice thing, but it's torn and smelly. I, I as a human being will be a little bit offended by that. I appreciate the, the, the thought. <laughs> That's about how far that goes, right? So we, we, we really need to examine what it is we have and what it is that we're doing. So let's look at James chapter 5. James 5. Yes, James is the pastor of the Jerusalem church. Exciting man, this. Verse 17. He's talking about Elisha, and he says, Elisha was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, see? And it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. And then verse 18 says, and he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. And that's the story we're going to deal with today. How do you call the blessings of God unto your life? How do you make it rain on you? If you fix this up, you'll be well on the way. You won't even need my prayer, I'm telling you. Or you won't need anybody's prayer. Because it's just you and the Lord. Hmm? Just you and the Lord. So, Elijah, and, and this, go back to 17, just, just in case you might be thinking that Elijah is a big man of God. No, it says he was a man with a nature like ours, like passions. In other words, he, he, if you read his profile you know, in the scriptures, he was not a very exciting guy. From time to time, he, he lost it. It doesn't make him a, a sinner. But he, it does make him a man. Like passions. A man with a nature like ours. You've got issues. Hmm? Because if you're driving on the street and somebody cuts across, man, I don't know what comes out of our mouths at that time. Hmm? Same thing. You're a man with a passion nature like ours. Don't go behind that person looking for him because then you're causing more trouble. Isn't it? How many people came behind me? <laughs> Pointing their fingers and giving me all kinds of fingers uh, addressing me. 
One person, one thing, one, one person even uh, pulled out a gun one time. Come this side. I don't worry about those people that talk a lot. Hmm? You know, people, people talk a lot. Hold me, hold me, hold me. <laughs> I worry about the quiet one. They don't say too much. That one. Bad guys. Now, what can prayer do? Because this is the, the, the common thing that Elijah had going there. He prayed. He prayed. He prayed two times. He prayed one time to close the heavens. And the heavens was closed for 42 months. No rain. And then he prayed again. All because of the word of the Lord, by the way. And the heavens opened. Gave rain. What was the problem? What was the problem? The problem was syncretism. The people were living in idolatry back in the day. And God wanted to deal with it. And he dealt with it through this guy. And today, you find in our context, the spirit is working and he's working off a template. And the template is Christ. And if there is secretism in our own worship, and it's not true worship, then the Lord will, will want us drawn, and he will do whatever it takes to get us back to him. He will speak like this. He will perhaps open up the scriptures to you, and perhaps talk to you right in the middle of your life, and say, stop that. Don't do that. Walk away from that. God is able to do that. And if you obey then the sky is the limit for you. Hmm. So what is God's vision? God's vision today is to bring his people together, is uniting them to worship the one God. And when Jesus was talking to the Samaritan woman, again, uh, it was about geography. And she was saying, uh, you, know, you Jews say we must worship in Jerusalem and we have worship here and then, the Lord said, it's neither here nor there. It's not in this coil or that temple where you must worship. But Father is seeking true worshipers who will worship him in truth, spirit, and in truth. So when you gather together like this, we had opportunity to gather together and to connect with the Lord. People don't connect because the altars are broken. Altars are broken. They can't do it Publicly, because privately it's all broken. Hmm? You tell me if I'm wrong. Hmm? So, to the story then. Story is an actual story is in First Kings chapter 18, but we'll go to 16 first. The reason that drought came. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, became king over Israel. Israel is God's people. And, and Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria for 32 years, 22 years. Now Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all the other kings, that is, who were before him. Do you think that the Lord knows when you are committing evil? Do you think the Spirit of the Lord knows when you're sinning? Yeah. I don't know if you know, if you come to Christ, the Spirit of God is in you. And he's a person. A person who can get offended. A person who can feel grief. And is grieved. Hmm? And if you have not dealt with those kind of things and you come before the Lord, you will find that offering is tainted. Now that's what I'm talking about. Syncretism. And it came to pass, verse 31 says, as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took a wife, Jezebel. This is the real Jezebel. Eh? This is where the name came from. And he took, a, took as wife, Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbal. You know what Ethbal is? What is Ethbal? Ethbal is what it means, is with Baal. Who now? Father-in-law. Father-in-law is with Baal. It's going downhill, you can tell, right? 
Now all that is evil in the sight of the Lord. He married Jezebel and she had a dad who was driven to all kinds of other things and he was going to take not just himself but he's going to take his entire tribe and entire nation into Baal worship which, which happened. That's why the drought and so he was um, the daughter of Edbal. And Edbal was a king. He was a king of the Sidonians. And he went, who now? Ahab. He went and served Baal and worshipped him. Do you think that is clean, pure worship? Or you think there's tainted? Mixing it all up. And, and every time I, I talk like this from the Old Testament, you want to figure out New Testament wise. How does that all fit? Yeah, when we do not offer ourselves to the Lord, then we are definitely offering ourselves to someone. And so Ahab, so then verse 32, then he set up, not only that, then he set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal, which he built in Samaria. He was going down, he was getting worse and worse with this guy. And then Ahab made an image, a wooden image. And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord of the God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Really? You think the Lord can't get angry? Of course he can. You think the, God, the Lord can't get jealous? Yes, he can. He gets grieved and offended. Yes, he can. Because he's a person. It's not an it. It's not a thing. It's God, almighty God, who is now living in us. And then we give our bodies in sinful behavior. I am saying to you, that is tainted. It messes up everything that God is doing and planning to do in our lives. But thank God for godly people. Because I tell you, your godliness and serving the Lord, your offering that is holy and without blemish, it, it, it pleases the Lord pleases him and God takes our offering is very pleased with it and he multiplies it and he blesses it and when you pray you can open heavens you can you don't need anybody to open heaven for you so his story starts who now Elijah chapter 17 verse 1 and Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab he spoke to who? The king. Who now? This king is that evil fellow I told you about. Spoke to him and he says, as the Lord, man he's a bold guy. This. this is what happens when you are serving the Lord. Your mouth can be very bold because the spirit of the Lord is now speaking through you. When you are living in sin, you would be tainted and messed up. You can't speak truth. You can't. Yeah, he goes, this guy went up there to the king who was a mess. He says, as the Lord of God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall, be, there shall not be dew or rain these years except at my word unless I say it's not going to happen for you. Imagine that. And then the months started. 30 months, 42 months. He went and hid himself because he thought this guy was going to put him away, send a hitman, put him away, which he did, tried to. So he hid and the Lord took care of him. You remember when there's a drought for 42 years, I'm trying to, I was trying to research that last night, I couldn't get it. You're 42 months, so how, does it, how does it affect the landscape? We get, we get no rain for a few months here and we feel like parched, right? But 42 months, I am saying this is devastation, real devastation. Not one crop and not one uh, animal that, that eats the crop would remain. And so this guy, he, he fled. The Lord said, I'm going to take care of you. Go to this river, the brook here and stay there. One widow will take care of you, will feed you. And I will send the ravens and give you food. That's the story. God was able to take care of you. In the middle of syncretism is able. Do you understand this? 
we must serve the Lord. We must serve him. We must live our lives for the Lord. We must worship him. Don't, let's not play this game. Let's don't play any games. Let's go before the Lord and love him and worship him. It's not about worship and how much we can do. No, it's about him. We must make, make sure we got that. So sometimes God deals with his people and he exactly, what he wants is to, for them to turn. And so what was God doing? He wanted to restore these people's altars. And, and what happened? Elijah did, he addressed them uh, at the end of 42 months. He addressed them uh, because now he's about to pray again for the rain to come. He comes back and he presents himself to Ahab and all these people. But he, then he said, and he said, listen, I'm not going to talk. I want all of the, the, the prophets of Baal. He knew that the false prophets. Bring them all. There were about 400 odd people. Bring them. I want to talk with them. And so in, in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 26, we read of what he did there. And he says, so uh, he told them, look, what you do, Earlier on, he says, look, each one of us must get a bull and um, you all must cry to your God and the God who answers by fire is the God that we must serve. How hard is that? You got everything, all the offering and then uh, they uh, will have to cry out to God and in this case, Baal. All the prophets of Baal, false prophets, must cry out to their God and if Baal were to set fire, then you know, that Baal is the God. So, they, that is the prophets of Baal, they took the bull which was given them and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning till evening. Eve, morning, eve, even till noon, saying, Oh Baal, hear us. But Baal was dead. You know, you know, such foolishness happens, in the, such foolishness. You know, as a young person, I was 16, 17, somewhere there. I'm thinking, where's the reality in this world? Where is it? Is, this is, is there any reality in this thing? I used to play this machine here before. I was like, well, what reality is there? You know, what, what is there? And I said, no, nothing. Everything is dead. And I said, oh, Lord, you know, I don't know who you are and what the story is. And I began to seek him in a very different way. And then somebody gave me a Bible. I read the book. Yeah, so I got to make sure that, that when I talk to God, that I'm talking to God. Right? I am talking to God. As a young person, I was doing drugs and I was enjoying my life. You think there's no enjoyment? Of course. Now they, they have legalized it. After all this time, they're legalizing it. I didn't try it yet. <laughs> <laughs> I can plant my own stuff. But that don't make it right. Hello? They can legalize even abortion. That don't make it right. Right? So many things I have to get away. You know what I'm trying to do here. <laughs> so, hear us. I've got to make sure I know I'm talking to God. I'm not talking to anybody else. But there was no voice. No one answered. Then they leaped about the altar which they had made. And, and so it was at noon, midday, that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he's meditating or he's busy or he's on a journey and perhaps he's sleeping and must be awakened. But people, people are like this. And so they cried aloud and they cut themselves. You know, it doesn't matter how much you cut yourself. Hmm? It doesn't mean your, your, your God is very really powerful. You will bleed. And so they cut themselves, as was their custom, with knives and lances until the blood gushed out on them. Don't get excited about that. And when midday was past, 
They prophesied until the time of the offering of the eating sacrifice and there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. How's that? Nothing happened all day. Then Elijah said to the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him. And then the first thing he did, he repairs the altar. He repairs the altar. Very important. They repaired the altar that was broken. And then he says he took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes. Again, this unity is trying to show that we're all one. There are only two tribes that were in that northern part. And he was now adding everybody else. Or there are only 10 tribes and the other two were there. And he brought all of them together by that altar. An offering to the Lord. 12 stones. Very important to God. When you bring a unity of the spirit in the church and people of God, you're not bad-mouthing anybody. Your offering will not be tainted. When you, that same mouth will praise the Lord. If you're cursing people, it won't work. That's why you need pundits like me to do kasrat for you. <laughs> yeah, then you will seek people out. To pray and tell me what you think I must do. Go oh, find yourself that thing. I'm telling, I told them many times, you're not listening. Verse 32. And so with these stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two seers of seed. He raised the wood, cut the bull, and laid it on the, on the wood. Then he said to them, fill four jars of water with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. You know how much of water? They don't have water, right? found the water. And it was a little bit of a hill. You have to carry the thing up there. Oh, four jars filled up. He says, do it again. So they put again. He says, do it a third time. They did it again. The water now is running from the flesh on the, on the altar, on the, on the stones and in the trench, running all over the place. The God of the covenant. I tell you, when you are preparing your altar to, of the Lord, and if your heart is right, your heart is in the right place, you can make it rain. For you. For you. That's why when you're praying and nothing much is happening in that particular, any, any area for that matter, then you need to ask questions of that. Maybe the Lord says, not now, I'm working on it. Or it may not be. So, verse number 36. What happened? Second thing he did, first thing was he rebuilt the altar. Second thing he did was he called on the name of the Lord. Verse 36. At the time of sacrifice, Elijah, the prophet Elijah, stepped forward and prayed, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I'm your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord, answer me. So these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you're turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burnt up the offering, the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. And when all the people saw this, they fell prostrate uh, and, and cried, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Do you know, I've had fire fall on my life when I gave myself to the Lord. You know, God receiving, God filling, God doing some powerful, miraculous things. I'm not special. We are all special in the eyes of the Lord. But if there's taints and, and mix, mixtures in your life, you must fix it. Repair the broken altars. We must come together. So the third thing he does, and the fire falls, and at Pentecost the people, when they say fire falls, they get very excited. Ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not over by it. Don't stop praying. The fire fell. And they're excited. No, it's not finished yet. What is the goal? Rain. It's not fire. What? Rain. So I don't get excited because people are just falling all over the place. Excitement. I want to see at the end of the day how they're doing. Have they come right? Have they stopped their nonsense talking? Have they organize their lives or they're not sleeping around anymore. Are they serving the Lord? Those kind of things are important. 
So what does he do? He confronts the darkness. He doesn't stop yet. This is how we have to deal with it. Because devils have come in into our lives. And we need to deal with those devils. And so verse 40. Then Elijah commanded them, the people that is, tell the people, seize the prophets of Baal. Catch them. Arrest them. Don't let anyone get away. They seize them. And Elijah had them brought to the Kishon Valley. And he slaughtered them there. Yeah. Obviously, we just can't go and kill everybody, all the ungodly people today. But our, our fight, our fight is not against flesh and blood. Our fight is against principalities and powers. There are devils here in this air fighting us every day, fighting us. How are we going to fight? How are we going to fight back? But if we've got a mixture going on in our own lives, Jesus is not present. Jesus who overcame the devil, if he's not present in your life, in your home, you can't win. Can't win. We must not rest until and when the fire comes, but we still must not rest. When the fire comes, we must pursue the enemy. The enemy is there. When I came to the Lord, I just, I just said to myself, that's it. From henceforth, I'm going to serve the Lord. And I was red for the enemy because he messed up my life. And I said, that's it. I'm quitting this. I'm quitting that. I'm walking away from that. And then eventually I left my job. I said, I'm going to serve the Lord. It's what I must do. Serve him. He wanted that from me. And so I was willing to give it. Lay it down. We must pursue the enemy by pressing into the Lord until we see the victory and the thing established, we have to continue to pursue the enemy. Can't wait for him to come to us. We have to deal with that thing in our own lives. Are you going to fight with me? Not with me. Join the Lord. Having the sword of the spirit, the word of the Lord is great. But knowing how to use the sword. And I'm teaching you a little bit how to do this. You can do it. Fire falling is one thing. We must now pursue the enemy. Fourthly, what he does, and this is the most important part. He calls forth the blessings of God. And I'll land with this. Verse 41. And Elijah said to Ahab, the king, same fellow, is what you do? You go, eat, and drink, for there is a sound of a heavy rain. This is out there in the field, they were. Says, Have your lunch. You brought lunch. Eat. Eat and drink because there's going to be a serious rain. You can't make it. You've got to eat and move. So Ahab went off to eat and drink. But Elijah, see, it's not time to eat and drink now. But Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel and he bent down to the ground and put his face between his knees. Now that posture, we must try this. Try, see if you can do this. Bend down to the ground and put your face between your knees. See if you can do it. That is the posture where Eastern or Middle Eastern woman giving birth. That's how they give birth. With their head between the knees. So he's there in that, in that place. He, he rebuilt the altar. He called on the name of the Lord. And then he ran off all those evil things. And now he wants to bring the rain. See? In James it says he prayed again. This was the prayer. How he prayed. He was giving birth to something. It was travail. And he says to his servant. Go and look toward the sea. He told his servant. And he went up and looked. The servant went up there. And see what he can see. And there is nothing there, he said. Seven times Elijah said, go back. Don't ever stop, I tell you. Don't ever stop. Things are not working like you're supposed to. Don't stop. Keep praying. Hello? There's time for you to thank him and praise him and all that. But not your time. You have to like give birth. 
you can't say at the middle of your, your labor, you're giving birth, this is right now, finish, baby. No, baby's not here yet. The seventh time, the servant reported, that he reported this. He says, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops. There are no dark clouds. He just put his hand in the size of a man's hand, superimposed against the sky. He says, that's how big the cloud was. It's a little thing if you look at it from the sky. He says, you know, I see that. He says, go tell that guy now, rain is coming. Calling forth the blessings of God to your life. Making it rain by fixing up some stuff in your own life. You can pray. You don't need anybody. Actually, you don't need anybody. Meanwhile, the sky in the meantime grew black with clouds and the wind rose and a heavy rain came and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. That was his capital. That's where he stayed. And the power of the Lord came upon Elijah and, and he tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab. <laughs> I don't know how many horses that fellow had, but he had, you know, four horses, I don't know, eight horses, the Ahab, eight horsepower. But this man is going, I don't know, 10 horsepower by the spirit, overtook him, overtook that man. You can't ever do that normally. But I'm telling you, when you love the Lord, don't stop praying about something. Don't give up because there are devils holding us back. Amen. And the devils don't want to move. Fix up some things in your life. Make sure that that is working, right? The altar sorted out. You call upon the name of the Lord and you pursue darkness. Pursue that thing. Deal with that thing. Don't keep talking to the devil, but you go for everything that's evil around you in Jesus' name. And then go and tuck yourself before the Lord and cry out to the Lord and give birth to this thing. So when there's a drought or a famine, the whole landscape was devastated, but it needs to be rebuilt. It needs to be re revived. And we need a, a spiritual springtime. And what Elijah did, he prayed. And then he prayed again. And this time giving birth to visions and dreams. Birthing, expecting, receiving. It's what we do, what we call to do as a people. But let's go fixing that altar. Now, I don't know whether you heard me today. I did my best. Hmm? Whether you heard me or not, I'm not sure. Uh, I maybe, uh, you know, you have to go home and figure it, figure it all out. Come back next week for a small dose again. Hmm? Whatever the Lord wants to do, you need to allow him. Would you do that? If you're very confused, go back and listen to this thing. And you're still confused, ask the Lord, what's happening? What's happening with me? Why am I not getting this? Seek the Lord. Would you? Would you stand with me, please? Pray for you. Pray with us. Okay. Stretch out your hand to the Lord. And you want to hand your life to the Lord? Wonderful. It's a good time to hand yourself to the Lord. What about the stuff that you're involved in? When you're restoring that altar and rebuilding it, it means that you're going to yield yourself to the Lord. It means you're saying no to darkness and yes to the Lord. I tell you, the Lord will honor you very much. He will honor you and come to your party if you honor him. And you walk away from that stuff. Walk away. Just say no. Just say no. Walk away. And God will receive you. You will see the Lord. And God will bless you. That's his promise. Just you and the Lord. Just you and the Lord. Father, I bring each one before you this morning. As we stand here, Lord... We're in need of prayer. We, are, we, are need, we, we need our altars rebuilt and re restored. 
we have even neglected calling on your name, Lord. Forget about pursuing darkness, pursuing the enemy until he is paralyzed in our lives. Forget the fact that we have neglected even to pray, to bring forth the babies that you want in this world, uh, visions and dreams. We're so far away. We have mixed faith, tainted faith, and therefore darkness prevails. You want us holy, acceptable, without blemish. And I know you examine us and you look at us. And here we are, we present again to you ourselves. Lord, this time with all our tintedness, our, our, our sores, our blemishes, you're the only one that can cleanse us. You're the only one that can heal us and free us. We're asking, we're really giving you permission to deal with it in our lives as we present ourselves before you today. Lord, I pray that you will be ruthless in our lives about those kind of things as we want also to be ruthless with sin and devils. I pray, Father, come, Lord, I pray. Take out of us everything that is evil, that which is not of you. Lord, let this altar be built. We want to see rain on our parched land. We want to see rain in our lives. We want to see that in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our world. Come, Lord, I pray. Come and meet us, Lord, I pray. Each one of us. Forgive us, Lord. We confess our wrongs. We confess our pain. We confess, Lord, our sins. I pray you'll heal us and free us. In Jesus' name. And I feel like the Lord reminded me to get you to pray like that. Just pray like that, would you? Not now. Also pray when you get home this week. Bring yourself like that. Tell him, confess your sins. Tell him where you have gone wrong. You're talking to the living God. The living God. He's alive. He hears. He knows. He gets offended. He gets, he, you know, all of that. But he's also a God who rejoices. Pleased. You bring a smile to him when you yield. When sons and daughters, his daughter's sons, obey him. It pleases him. May, 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 may your dreams come true. You know, may this week, that which you pray about would happen for you. May the Lord show you the connection between what you just did and that answer. I pray for you.